So I'm going to just now, having hopefully left you all stunned and your, your apple pie cuddling in your stomachs, <laughs> I'm going to tell you what does cause heart disease. Mm. And the reason I'm a skeptic is that I, I started looking at heart disease from this direction. And having spent years and years thinking there is another explanation for heart disease, I realized the cholesterol hypothesis had to be wrong uh, and that it was wrong. The cause of stress, this cause of stress, the cause of heart disease is stress. Now, the problem with making this point is that, um, is that nobody knows what stress is. Um, and neither do I, really. However, when I'm talking about stress, I'm, I'm using a very specific uh, definition of it. But you've all seen these curves where, where, where performance goes up with stress and then it reaches a point and then it all comes back down again. Uh, and all GPs are coming down here somewhere. <laughs> Probably about here. And uh, performance is beginning to, to go up. The fact is that, that of course, um, when you talk about stress, it's very important to know that, that the, same, if the same thing can affect people in two different ways. Somebody might lose their job and be horribly stressed, and, and, and it's a, a terrible thing for them. Somebody else might lose their job and feel liberated and free and go off and do other things. There was a study in, uh, in the United States looking at uh, Chinese Americans. Uh, Chinese American, Chi in, uh, in China, number four is, is, um, is, is bad luck. And what they discovered was on the fourth day of the month, the, the mortality rate for Chinese Americans was 20% higher than any other day of the, of, of the month. Now, the number four doesn't affect me or I don't know other people in here because it doesn't mean anything to us. So the same stress or, if you like, can create a completely different effect in the person. So there's no point saying, oh, it's terribly stressful moving house because some people might enjoy it. Well, I'm really laughing if you enjoy moving house. But other people, it's absolutely hellish. So, so what you have to look at is, well, what's the impact? And is the impact on people, is it measurable? Can you measure it? Does it exist? Is it, is it measurable? There's a chap, if you, if you, if you type Bjorn Torp, I don't know how you pronounce it, I'm afraid he's sadly dead, he's a Swedish researcher, did a huge amount of research looking at people with heart disease, also things like depression, populations with high rates of heart disease, and measuring 24-hour cortisol secretion in these people. And what he found was that if you um, had had heart disease or depression or were in a population with a high rate of heart disease, that you saw a flattened or burnt out uh, cortisol secretion. These people had a measurable dysfunction of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis along with the sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system. And when you analyze people who suffer post-traumatic stress disorder, interestingly people with fibromyalgia, there's a study in Manchester going on, people with fibromyalgia demonstrate dysfunctional HPA axis. All right? So there's clearly people demonstrating this effect. Now what happens then is if the HPA axis is dysfunctional, you have an overdriving sympathetic nervous system and you have a flattened stress response. And then this affects the body in certain ways. It creates the metabolic syndrome. This is Bjorn Trump's research. Another chap called Krusos who's done an awful lot of work on this as well. He demonstrated this. Now, the, the metabolic syndrome, as you know, is raised blood pressure, abdominal obesity, high HDL, low low HDL, high VLDL, which is triglycerides, raised clotting factors, e.g. fibrinogen, insulin resistance, um, uh, or with raised levels of insulin, raised blood sugar levels. There's a lot of other things that are on here as well. And interestingly, Borntor looked at people with depression and found that if you have severe depression, you can actually develop type 2 diabetes due to your depression. And if your depression is cured, your type 2 diabetes is also cured, cause and effect. And people who are given antidepressants Actually, these factors improve them. So um, that's all very well. How does it? How does that then go on to cause heart disease? It has nothing to do with LDL or cholesterol. There is a, a hypothesis called response to injury. Some of you may have heard of it. Some of you may not. It, there's thousands of papers on this thing called response to injury. What causes atherosclerotic plaques to develop? There's three things that happen. There's endothelial injury, either the endothelium is stripped off or damaged or in some way something happens to it. This is followed by a thrombus forms on that area of endothelium. And then there's a repair process. And this is where I remember talking about endothelial progenitor cells. Once a thrombus forms inside an artery wall, the endothelial progenitor cells come and they stick to it. And they stick to it and they grow and they cover it up. 
And so the next thing that happens is you have a thrombus behind the endothelium. So when people say, how did everything get through the endothelium? The answer is they don't. When those things happen, the endothelium isn't there. This is initially fatty streak development. The repair system almost certainly gets rid of the, the thrombus because when you look at what's in a, a plaque, it's exactly the same thing as in a thrombus. You find fibrin, fibrinogen, red blood cells, white blood cells. Um, lipids are drawn into the creation of, 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 of thrombus. The, the, apart from platelets, the other thing that makes up thrombus is, uh, are lipoproteins, and especially a lipoprotein called lipoprotein A. I'm not going to go into that because that would take too long. So essentially, if this hypothesis w is correct, then anything that increases damage to the endothelium is likely to increase your risk of dying of getting more plaques forming. Anything that makes the thrombuses that form bigger and more difficult to get rid of is likely to increase your risk of heart disease. And anything that damages the endothelial progenitor cell production is going to damage, is going to increase your risk of heart disease. Because what's going to happen is you're going to have endothelial injury repeat, 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 repeat. If you look at a lot of plaques, they, they're like cutting through a, a tree. You can see bands like band after band after band of repeated thrombus formation at the same point. The final one is the one that, 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 that kills you. Um, endothelial progenitor cells. What causes these to reduce in number? Steroids cause these to reduce in number. Steroids are a major risk factor for heart disease. Age. Why do people get more heart disease when they get older? Everyone just takes it for granted. But there has to be something going on. Not all diseases are more frequent when you're older. What happens is, there's a stepwise reduction in endothelial progenitor cell production as you get older. What else causes endothelial progenitor cells to reduce in number? Renal failure. Because in renal failure, the kidney don't produce the hormones that trigger the growth factor production in the bone marrow. And um, so, so you can see why having a low CKD and all that is associated with high rate of heart disease. Cause accelerated heart disease. Systemic lupus erythematosus. Women under the age of 50 with SLE have 70 times the risk of heart disease as women who don't have it. Steroids are used in SLE and all these other, and all these other conditions. Thrombus formation, anything that increases thrombus formation. Stress hormones increase thrombus formation. Raised fibrinogen levels increase thrombus formation. And now I'm going to make a horrible admission. When you've got familiar hypercholesterolemia, your blood becomes hypercoagulable, primarily due to increased fibrinogen. Um, levels in the blood and also um, uh, because the, the, um, the, the lipids themselves become focuses for thrombus formation. Endothelial injury, high blood sugar levels, smoking. So you can see that potentially you can start to say, what I say to people about heart disease is it's not, a, if you like it's not a disease, it's a process and it's this process and if things go wrong with this process, plaques develop more, more rapidly they become unstable and then they rupture. I just use this diagram for a couple of points. I've used it for other people. The first thing, although this is just a, just a, just a diagram, I want to make up two points. People say, how can LDL, um, or how can lipoproteins get, get past the endothelium when the endothelium doesn't allow lipoproteins through? I say, well, have you ever seen these little boys here? These are capillaries. Anything can leak into the artery wall from behind. But the other important thing for me here is just to say that when, when they say there's a plaque in the foam cells, the endothelium is, is not damaged at this point. So whatever's happening, these things can't get through the endothelium. The endothelium is repairing over it. This is an endothelial cell and this is another endothelial cell. Now in vivo, they're joined together at the hip. You can't get anything past them. They act as barriers. So. Just moving back to the LDL hypothesis for a moment, when people say to me that LDL can link to the end, leak through the endothelium, I say to them, how? It can't go through an endothelial cell, it can't get past them. The only way anything can get past an endothelial cell, unless the endothelial cell wants it past, is if the endothelium isn't there at the time. 